For more than a thousand years, Istanbul was the center of Southeast Europe. In the 20th century, when Ankara became the capital of the new Turkish Republic, only an empty shell seemed to remain of the power and culture of Istanbul. 20th century and the history of the Republic, in some ways, did not uh, provide uh, the best conditions for Istanbul. Istanbul was being punished because of its cosmopolitan past. Istanbul is uh, proverbially known as the place where the earth and the stone are made of gold. More than 150,000 Greeks were living in Istanbul. Today there are about 2,000 Greeks. But the churches are here, there are houses, there are buildings. This is a society that specializes on forgetting rather than remembering. My family came to Istanbul in 1968. My father worked as a housekeeper. Later, he managed to buy some land in an illegal settlement. You're not really allowed to offer such land for sale, but that's what people did. I started work the day after I left school. On the inside, I see a decline which cannot be seen from the outside. From outside, it looks wonderful. We have bridges, beautiful buildings, nice streets, but inside, you can see a decline. There are people who say, no, 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 we are the founders of the country and we are the real rulers of the country. We will never give this up. We don't trust uh, the popular vote or the way the people think in the society. I like the choices that I have in Istanbul to explore different things. There's so much variety. It's how many differences it embodies that keeps you addicted in a way to Istanbul. Today, Istanbul is the biggest city in Europe. Its population has grown from 1 million to 12 million in 40 years. Most are immigrants from Anatolia, people who need houses, work and new infrastructure. Istanbul has mastered this rapid change so far. However, there are many unresolved tensions inherited from its recent past. Under its shiny surface, there are also bitter conflicts between old and new elites, which are shaking the country. Back in the 80s, a friend of mine who was running a cultural association uh, asked me if I would take a group of people around the Golden Horn. And everybody was terribly interested and, and surprised. Uh, this was very new, they'd never been there. They used to see that big building, which they thought was the Patriarchate, etc. We come out of the synagogue and point out to the other synagogue over the corner and then step into the Greek Orthodox Church and then in the next street we have the Armenian Church and from there we come to the mosque, etc. And this is all uh, fascinating and, uh, and very new for the people I take around in these tours. Murat Belge was born in 1943. The professor of literature, author and political analyst knows Istanbul like the back of his hand. These houses once belonged to Greeks, Armenians, Jews. Most left Istanbul in the 20th century. In his books and his work as a tour guide, Belge tells people the history of his home city. People uh, in Istanbul have forgotten because they never were reminded that this city had a very multicultural, multi-religious life. I feel very bad for the people who have left, and I don't feel bad for the people who have come in. In 1453, the Ottomans built the fortress of Rumeli Hisar at the narrowest point of the Bosphorus and conquered the city from here. 
Construction of the fortress involved Armenian Christian stonemasons. Some of them settled around the castle. Their descendants are still here today. I came here 60 years ago. There were 400 Armenians here then. Now there are 30 or 35. Mr. Abrahamoulou is looking after the 500-year-old church. Mass is celebrated rarely, here for the church's patron, Saint Santouch. Most of them are old people. Christians do not settle here anymore. It is far from the city. There is no Armenian school. The young don't want to live here. Turks and Armenians used to celebrate together. Many Turks used to come to our feasts and we talked to each other. In the old Rumeli Hisari, we were friends with the Turkish Muslims. Above Rumeli Hisari, there is a settlement, a Gecikondu. This literally means built overnight. The immigrants initially put up illegal shanties. Later, with increasing prosperity, multi-storey houses were built. They established themselves here gradually, building their gechi kondus. We just watched them. This used to be strawberry gardens, fields and cow sheds. Now it's all gechi kondu. Mehmet Bey was a little boy when his father came here. When his father died, Mr. Mehmet took over his work. He looks after the funerals and the graves. The cemetery belongs to our church. Of course, I wish that the Armenians hadn't gone. Mr. Abrahamoulu knows few of the new immigrants, except farmer Mehmet, who keeps his bees, seven dairy cows and a vegetable garden on the cemetery. In return, he maintains the old graves. Abrahamoulu suspects the time of the Armenians here is coming to an end. I don't want to leave here. There's no better place to live. It's like a village here and I feel at home. Also, I've grown old, where should I go? Like this, I can at least die here. Many of the immigrants living here are second or third generation. Where once there was a large forest, now there is estate after estate with the access road to the Bosphorus Bridge cutting through the Gece Kondu. The immigrants still remember the beginnings of all this in Baltaimani. We had no water and no electricity. There was one well in the middle of the quarter, but it was a kilometer away. The roads weren't surfaced. There was no sewage system. We were in a very difficult situation. Then we got help from the municipality, and a lot has changed. Gradually, the Gece Kondus were supplied with streets, gas and electricity. The municipal help came late, and it came through the conservative AKP, which has its base among the newcomers from Anatolia. The AKP is the only party with an office here. We built a party office in our district to improve our service. We wanted better coordination with the city administration in order to use the municipal services. Conservative Islamic parties have been running Istanbul since 1994. As millions of Anatolians settled here, the face of the city has changed, and yet the new settlers find it hard to understand how the AKP could be seen as a threat. There is no reason to fear the AKP. Our Prime Minister was mayor here for years. He didn't turn Istanbul into an Iran or a Saudi Arabia. Everybody can see that. She managed the transition without any help. Sibel Tehik came from Gaziantep, in the southeast of the country. Most of her six sisters were married by the age of 13. 
her memory of that world is still fresh. It is very difficult to go out alone there. Here, it's okay. I can go alone to the shops and the market, or just go for a walk, something I didn't know before. In the small towns, you're never left in peace. A girl is restricted in every respect. She can't go alone outside the house or speak with a boy. That's immediately given the wrong interpretation. Imagine a girl going out with a boy. The family hears about it or even sees it. It has happened. They killed her. The uncle incited his brother to murder his daughter. That's really what happened. I didn't experience women who complained publicly about violence in their families. That's why the police don't intervene. But here, it's not just the police that help. Everyone is alert. There are a lot of differences. At first, I was very nervous in the big city, but it's fine now. I really love Istanbul. I love going shopping in the Grand Bazaar. I enjoy strolling around there. I've bought clothes for my daughter. I've bought vases. Household things interest me. I've bought some plates. I came in 1998, after I married. My husband worked here. I was engaged at 17. That's too young, but I didn't realize that. I also never wanted to wear a headscarf. My husband insisted, but later I took it off again. I really wanted to study. I wanted to know everything. That was my only dream. But there, they wouldn't let women learn. They said, what use is that to a girl? I only went five years to elementary school. Here, I can at least stand on my own two feet and work. Sibel Tehik only goes to the east for family visits. Here in Istanbul, she sees better prospects for herself and her daughter. My dream is that my daughter gets a good education. I want my daughter to be strong and stand on her own feet. I want her to rescue her life by going to school. I will tell her about love and respect. I want her not to get discouraged. She should be happy. She and her husband will have mutual respect for each other. I want her to protect herself. I will always tell her that I'm behind her. The juxtaposition of Istanbul's lifestyles. A booming economy makes this possible. Istanbul has been growing horizontally for years. Now it's growing vertically and underground. The ever-increasing traffic necessitates a massive expansion of public transport. A lot of work for entrepreneurial legend Ishak Alaton, whose company is supervising the constructing of the new underground system. At the age of 22, I went to Sweden uh, as a welder worker, and I spent two and a half years of my life in Sweden. And I brought back to Turkey in 1954 this mentality of private entrepreneurship which is combined with social democracy. First creating wealth and then sharing wealth with uh, the society where you live. Ishak Alaton comes from an old Jewish family in Istanbul. In the 1960s he was already running an economic holding. From the late 80s he developed his company Alako into an international economic giant. Turkish Prime Minister Turgut Özal opened Turkey's economy. Previously, import-export restrictions and an all-powerful bureaucracy strangulated the economy. In the 1980s, it was impossible to convince the bureaucracy to sign 
an agreement for importing new ideas of technology. They wouldn't allow you to pay for new ideas. Now it is free and you can integrate your economy and your industry in such a way that you can become the number one in the world for quality. We have cheaper prices, the same quality of technology, the highest in the world. It's a booming economy, it's a booming time for the next generations, and we should have confidence in this system of globalizing by not interfering. Hypermodern shopping centers are being put up all across the city. Here, Istanbul's old elite meets the successful immigrant class. The religious and the secular united in consumption, something previously inconceivable. We were involved in Istinia Park by giving them ideas about how it should be developed because they are good friends of ours. And then uh, they uh, rented us a big part of it, which we are occupying as a sports center that is called Hillside City Club. People meet, people congregate, people exchange ideas, and people learn from each other the uh, good part of life, the quality of life. So, quality of life is all the time increasing, which is a fantastic thing for the Turkish society. You can see it everywhere, how vibrant, how mixing, and how democratic it is becoming. It's probably 15 or maybe 20 years that we need, but there is no doubt about it, that the Turkey of tomorrow will be ready to become part of the European Union. When I started riding, it was only the creme de la creme of the country that could afford to ride. My father um, was very skeptical and he didn't want my mother to take me to the riding stable because he said she's going to want a great horse, she's going to want the best boots, she's going to want the, you know, the house with the pool. My friends from the riding stable were largely the, the, the sons and daughters of the business elite of Istanbul at that time. Nigar Gökseil, the daughter of a Turkish businessman and an American teacher, first made a name for herself as Turkish horse riding champion in 1997. Now she's a social scientist researching social change in Turkey. Her upper class contacts help her, but she's aware of very different social realities. The Istanbul Riding Club remains a bastion of the old dominating elite, but change is evident. Riding is no longer just an elite sport. Right now, some of the best riders of Turkey are actually the children of, of grooms that migrated to Istanbul in the 70s or 80s and took care of horses, M maybe didn't know Turkish even, or didn't know how to read and write. The grooms that took care of the horses or the cleaning ladies in the house that were maybe the only facets where life of the two different realities of Istanbul met each other. The head-scarved women are the wives of the grooms and maybe of some of the riders at this tournament. They sit just a little aside from the upper-class audience, but even that is a real change. When I went to Washington the first time, I was 22 years old, and um, I would go to a coffee shop on my street. I was extremely confused to see this woman serving coffee also doing sports at my gym because in Turkey that would never have happened. You would live in totally different parts of the town, you would do very different things, you would never have had that kind of a situation. In the past years, Nigar Göksel researched the role of women in Turkey. She thinks that the increasing public visibility of women from traditional families is a positive sign also where she lives in Yeniköy, on the Istanbul Riviera. Yeniköy, you would rarely ever have seen a woman with a headscarf 15, 20 years ago. Um, and if you did, she was probably a cleaning lady. Now, she lives here, 
uh, and she mixes with the rest of the crowd. In Turkey, there are a segment of society that believes that as Islam becomes more prominent in public life, women's rights will decrease, women will go backwards. Liga Göksel has also seen many changes in the less developed east of Turkey. We set out to do empirical research to understand where the country is really going and what the trends are. And um, it's been an exciting journey that's taken us from central Anatolia to the southeast. We talked to hundreds of women from many walks of life and uh, from a wide geographic uh, span. And we find men that are very enthusiastic about their daughters learning to read and write and um, not be like his mother was, um, not be desperate, not be dependent. You don't have to give up your family values or your cultural priorities in order to be able to be integrated and be active in public life. The advances evident across the country are not only the effects of economic change. Under AKP rule, the penal laws have changed fundamentally and the legal status of women has improved. For example, when a woman is, is raped by a man, if he accepted to marry her after this, he would not be penalized under the previous penal code. And that encompassed the mentality that even the judges of this country were carrying in the late 90s, which was totally unacceptable. The efforts of Turkish feminists paved the way for change, but in the end it was the prospect of EU accession that gave impetus to these reforms. The civil code changed, the penal code changed, the employment law changed, there were new initiatives to combat domestic violence, there were new initiatives to get girls to go to school, to primary school, and uh, these all happened from 2001 uh, onwards. There are 32 districts in Istanbul. Since 1994, I have been the only female deputy mayor. In Kadıköy, I look after women, children and employment projects. That was and is my work. Every year on International Women's Day, I say in my interviews, please give one woman colleague in every district the chance to be deputy mayor. The first family centers appeared in Kadıköy in 1994. Overall, fewer than 25% of women in Turkey are employed. In Kadiköy, 48% of women have work, almost exactly equal with men. The women in these training centers are mainly newcomers from Anatolia. Everything, including childcare, has been provided to create an environment to support them. Inci Bespina has put a comprehensive system in place. If you ask these people, they will say that they can do anything, and that means in reality they can't do any work. First, they must learn to read and write. Then they can do vocational training. After that, we can help them find work. That's what our project is trying to achieve. I work, I attend the course when I have free time. When I'm better at it, I'd like to start a business. I already phoned one or two months before. When does the course begin? Then I saw it on the posters. Because of the children, it is hard to attend such a course elsewhere. This place is good, the atmosphere. That's why I like coming here. My husband hasn't got anything to do with it. I talk to him about it, but he doesn't interfere in my decisions. There was a really pretty woman called Esma. I won't forget that. She had blue eyes and light skin. One day, she lifted her skirt and said, Look, Inchi, I have platinum in both legs. I was so badly beaten that my bones did not grow together. That's why I have platinum in my legs. At that time, we had no shelter for women. I asked her whether she wanted a lawyer. 
He told her to submit a complaint, but she had no other accommodation, so she had to return to her home. We had to send her away. For me, as deputy mayor, it was a painful experience. A few days later, I read the headline, Man Kills His Wife With An Axe. When I read that, I felt really ashamed. Turkey has a real problem with violence against women. We must not turn a blind eye. Inci Bespina admires Ataturk. Under him, women's rights improved in the early years of the Republic. But much remained to be done. Bespina founded the country's first public shelter for women in the 1990s. For the inhabitants of Kadakui, our women's shelter is easily sufficient, but the problem is not just the women of Kadakui. We are the gateway for all Anatolia. If a woman suffers from domestic violence, she gets on a bus or a train. She gets out in Karakoy and goes to the police or the hospital. I'm 37. I have four children, including a 22-year-old son. I would also have a 23-year-old daughter, but I was beaten and she died in my belly. If I had known of this place, I would not have married. I would have gone to school here, would have learned something. At first, I ran away with my children and delivered them to the social services. They recommended this place to me. They said that I could continue my fight from here. Before, I thought I was completely alone. I was very introverted. Only when I saw my sisters in fate did I say, there are also others who go through this. There are others in this struggle. What problems do Turkish women have? First, a very serious education problem. Second, an employment problem. There are economic problems and problems with women's health. The children of our women die and they are very frustrated that there is no answer. The women are victims of men's violence, coming from husbands, fathers, brothers and other family members. It's about human rights. The headscarf is one of the last problems Turkish women have. The headscarf question divides the country. In 2007, the opposition organized mass demonstrations against presidential candidate Abdullah Gül because his wife wears the headscarf. A year later, the ruling AKP sought to amend the constitution to allow headscarf students to attend university. The public prosecutor then wanted to close the AKP. The majority of Turks disapproved. As a woman, you put your scarf and you feel safer if you have to get on the bus and people will probably not pinch you. So this is not really, a, you know, a people craving for Sharia law or anything like that. Journalist Aisha Berhula is one of the founders of the governing AKP. She gained worldwide acclaim with her documentary about the daily lives of women in Muslim countries. We were in 13 different countries drawing a profile of the Muslim woman. It took two years to record. Turkey is completely different from other Islamic countries. Turkey is a multicultural society. Many different cultures existed in Anatolia. That perhaps makes Turkish Islam more tolerant. It is the reason why it fits democracy better. In the summer of 2008, the public prosecutor's office sought to ban her, along with 70 leading members of the AKP, from active politics for five years, even though as a veiled woman, she's not allowed to hold a public position anyway. I think that we have waged a struggle over the headscarf. In the conservative world, there was the view that the woman should stay in the house. That has completely changed. The girls who went to university in the 80s and then pursued a career have played a major role. Since then, it's been considered normal for women with headscarves to work. I don't go to religious places often, perhaps to the Suleimani Mosque, which is very beautiful, where we find a deeply religious atmosphere. 
e, huşul mu diyeceğiz artık yani dini anlamda bir şey bulur. Wenn ich die gläubigen Menschen ansehe, sage When I see these believers, I say, yes, as a child I once believed in fairy tales. These were very nice, and I wanted the world to be the same, but it wasn't. I regard faith in God as a complete absurdity. There is no evidence in nature, no evidence at all. This is where Aisha Bohöhle is also active, a meeting in the stately Çura'an Palace. She sits on the Commission for Istanbul as European Capital of Culture 2010. She believes social resentment lies behind the attacks against religious people. There is a lack of acceptance that those in power come from the once despised religious people from the countryside. You used to be the lower classes, now you are above us and rule us. This is not accepted in the structure of the Republic and by a small elite group. On the other hand, it makes the masses very happy. They see people like themselves in power. 2002, the newly founded AKP wins a convincing election victory. Their key promise, improving the economy. In our founding committee, as well as in the executive board, there are religious people and liberals, nationalists and members with no connection to religion. Whenever possible, we want women and men to work together and really get involved with society. Of course, we still have men and even some women who are against it. In view of the AKP's pro-European foreign and domestic policies, Ayşe Berhula finds the accusations of Islamism absurd. What sort of secret agenda is the AKP supposed to have? Introducing Sharia law in Turkey? It makes little sense to accuse a party of this when it is liberal, adapted to capitalism, working in a democratic framework and a secular legal system and when it is bringing the country's legal framework closer to EU standards. The world-renowned scientist Jalal Schenger has a very different view. He fears a growing influence of religion on politics and society, especially in the education system. The current government consider the universities as places to conquer, for their people, for their worldview. We now have hundreds of thousands of graduates from religious high schools. And you say, aha, they must go to university. If I have a girl in front of me with all the symbols of Islam, how can I explain to her the history of our planet? I know that she doesn't want to believe that. All the leaders of the AKP come from the lower classes of society, and these lower classes don't live in modern cities, so they have no idea of modern city life. They come from the slum districts of Istanbul. They have no good education. Most went to these religious schools, and most of them do not speak any foreign languages. Most of our intellectuals are in the military. They have better schools and consider themselves the guardians of civilization and democracy in Turkey. And that is, of course, a danger for those who want to turn Turkey into a theocracy. Atatürk said, there is only one civilization, and that is a civilization which is based on enlightenment, reason and science. Schenger began his successful career as an officer in the Air Force. Close relations to the military is still a hallmark of the old elite, which wants to defend the secular state with all possible means, if necessary at the cost of democracy. They're spreading rumors. There's a very recent case involving myself. Zaman newspaper claims that I support military coups. I've never done that. I never said that. 
I just said that a coup may be necessary in the life of a state. It's like a surgical operation. Murat Belga was a victim of one of these operations. He was arrested as a member of the left after the 1971 coup and spent two years in prison. Istanbul, although the climate uh, does not make it necessary, uh, was very much an indoor city. We did not have a Parisian or sort of Italian tradition. It's become very much an alfresco city. Uh, under the AKP municipalities. Turkey is urbanizing fast. There is a thriving, very dynamic business life. For the first time, we have a bourgeoisie that is coming of age. Intellectuals like Belga do not want the state to patronize them. Like many others, he's ready to challenge taboos and to raise critical questions. Also about the Republic's founding ideology, Kemalism. Kemal was the, the most brilliant man in his milieu at the time he lived. A brilliant strategist, a very good soldier, and a very ardent westernizer. And maybe he was too successful. And instead of uh, putting society in a straitjacket, more care and affection could be spared for creating a stronger civil society rather than treating society as a child to be fed this and fed that. Present day Kemalism has almost nothing to do with Kemalism as it was. They are hostile to the United States, they are hostile to the European Union, they are hostile to Western democratic ideals. There were three coups between 1960 and 1980. Each time it was to save the ideals of Ataturk from Turkey's internal enemies. When a society has a military intervention every 10 years, 60, 70, 80, then there are sort of intangible but very strong relationships between these individuals. So it's this patriarchal, paternal state composed of judges, soldiers, the managers of all the state enterprises. And uh, because the political ideologies, political movements, etc., have been purged, all the possible, all the potential opposition is now inevitably behind the AKP. The real Turkey that Europe should concern itself about is this Turkey that is trying against all odds uh, to reach a stage where we can build a democratic Turkey. Murat Belge has received personal protection from the state since early 2007. There has been a series of mysterious assassinations of critical minds in Turkey, people who addressed national taboos. There's still a risk attached, as the world-renowned writer Perihan Maden also knows. I'm going to write about these issues. It's my natural right as a columnist. Every human has a right not to kill. And if you are doing your military service in Turkey, there is a big chance that you might be killing someone because there is an ongoing war uh, in southeast of Turkey since 30 years. So I write this article and um, the head of the army made a complaint to the prosecution. Eleven court proceedings are pending against Mardin. Those who criticize the army are, in the opinion of the old elite, shaking the state's foundations. They have no accountability. No one can ask them any questions about their budgets. So their status is like maybe um, in middle age, how you kings used to be. Veneration of Ataturk is taught in Turkey from early childhood. But it is not only about Ataturk. Turkey was founded by a general. Mustafa Kemal was a soldier. If you have seen in the elementary schools how kids are brought up with this incredible Mustafa Kemal worshipping, which extends to worshipping the Turkish army. The army is supposed to be our saviour and protector forever and ever. 
The worshipping of the armed forces is not only folklore like this military parade on National Day. Nationalist media loyal to the military try to intimidate voices like Mardin's. Then I saw that I was one of the targets of this country. Targumen above their headlines and everything. They put my picture and they wrote, curse this ugly woman. And they put a picture of mine. For an article I wrote, uh, some nationalist Turkish kids in Lise, in Turkish gymnasium, they are putting needles to their fingers and they are dropping blood. So from blood they make a flag and they send it to the head of our army, Yashar Buchanan. He has tears in his eyes. He calls the cameras, the television crews, show this flag made from blood, blood flag from the Turkish kids in high school. Mahden's book, Two Girls, about the lesbian love of two teenagers in Istanbul, had enormous success. For the judicial authorities, she's a threat to the nation. I have actually two imprisonment sentences. I am imprisoned, but they are, uh, it's like on probation. And if I get a third prison sentence, then the uh, court should say that I should be sent to a prison. We will see. There are and have been such trials against many authors. In the public gallery, former cadre of the police and army and their friends in the media and the law. They went to Orhan Pamuk's court. Uh, they went to Elif Shafak's court, they went to mine and Hrant Dings. To Hrant Dings, Beli Küçük showed up. And he said, this is an ominous sign, you know, this is a horrible sign. It's like an oman, you know, it's like a Stephen King horror novel, you know. Nineteenth of January, two thousand and seven, the Armenian journalist and author Ran Dink was shot in front of the offices of the weekly Argos in the Sisli district. This murder changed Turkey, but not as the perpetrators intended. The lawyer Fetiye Setin remembers. Ran was someone who touched people's hearts and consciences with his warmth. Herand could somehow find a way to everyone. In Turkey, this soldier has the last word. There's no more discussion. The soldier owes no one any explanation. The greatest taboo was, and is, the Armenians in 1915. Herand actually wanted to change the historical images of Turkey built on hostility, to change the everyday statements and policies. Hundreds of thousands came to Hrant Dink's funeral. Most of them were Turks. The people of Istanbul gave a powerful signal. The message was, we are all Armenian. We are all Hrant Dink. Intimidation and terror must come to an end. Those who did not know Hrant were also desperate. They went out into the streets and those who couldn't go out sat in front of their TVs and wept. All this repressed grief was freed by Heran's death. Unsolved murders and threats against journalists and authors have caused fear for years. The campaign against Dink was triggered by his research that claimed that an adopted daughter of Atatürk, the first female Turkish pilot, Sabiha Goethe, was of Armenian descent. Dink published this, and a prosecution followed immediately. In 2004, Herant wrote in the Agos newspaper that Sabiha Gukke was of Armenian descent. Immediately afterwards, the chief of staff issued a very strongly worded statement. Herant was summoned to the governor and warned and threatened, according to his statements. Practically the next day, demonstrations began in front of the Agos offices. They shouted things like, Heran Dink, you're our target. In 2008, with strict security in force, the trial of the murderers began. The demonstrators in front of the court demand transparency. Dink himself had been accused two years before. His enemies had shown no inhibitions then. 
When we got him out of the garage with the police and brought him through the corridor, there were people trying to break the cordon. Men and women were trying to jump over it in order to insult Herant, to spit at him and jostle him. We were pelted with coins and pens in the courtroom, insulted, as his lawyer, I was threatened. The trial turned into a lynch campaign against Harant. The gunman, Ögün Zamast, was 17 at the time of the killing. It is clear that he wasn't alone. He had met with representatives of the so-called deep state. These people are encouraged by certain others to think they are heroes. When Ugun Samast was first arrested, he was treated like a hero by some police and soldiers. We saw the pictures. Today, the public prosecutor's office believes that the murder of Dink and others could be connected to the terror network Ergenikon, with members from the Secret Service, Army and Police, journalists and lawyers, who see themselves as saviors of the state. As far as I can infer from the notes and minutes, there are four people amongst the conspirators who have now been arrested as part of the Ergenikon investigation. And I think that in this organization, there are not only the police, but also many other people from different walks of life. I believe that we can only find the real powers behind the murder of Herant Dink if all this is completely open. Many people have begun to follow Haran Ding's route. This process can no longer be stopped. In spring 2007, the magazine Nokta published plans for a military coup against the AKP government by senior military figures. Nokta was closed down, but in 2008, the public prosecutor's office began arresting Ergenikon conspirators, among them former generals named in the Nokta articles. Yasemin Tsonga. Those crews killed many people. Many people were executed. But never, ever we tried a general for doing that. Now, former four-star generals are under arrest in custody, and now we see the traces of this organization, which is now named Ergenekon, in all these murders and um, attacks and, uh, and other kinds of activities. And now we're trying to cleanse that out of the system. And while we're doing it, I think we're realizing that it's not possible to do it if you don't go after the military. And I think it will set up an example to many people in Turkey that you know, being part of such an organization is a crime and is punishable by law and no one is untouchable. In summer 2008, the conspirators were awaiting their trial. At the same time, the Supreme Court narrowly decided not to ban the AKP and its leaders. In the meantime, many Nokta journalists and other critical spirits found a new home in the new daily Taraf. I don't remember, certainly not in my lifetime, that there has been a paper who is really truly independent from business interests, from you know political interests, from the government, from the military, and who is also you know courageous enough to criticize all those centers of power equally. Is the religious conservative majority which rules Turkey a threat to secularism? In Turkey now we have a new class of people, very conservative, very religious in their way of life, but also very much of global thinkers and actors. So it's a new powerful class, an emerging middle class, an emerging ruling class also. And AKP represents them much better than any other party did in Turkish history. As a woman who doesn't practice Islam and who has been educated in the West, let's say, I'm not afraid at all.
Turkey today is full of contradictions, but also full of hope and dynamism. Coming to terms with its growing diversity is also its opportunity. It remains an open question when and whether a liberal Turkey will come to terms with its past and become a full member of the European family, something most Turks would like. Thank you.